everybody tonight. Uh, my name is Connie Emerson. I'm the port, uh, program coordinator. And uh, our speaker tonight, as most of you know, is Hector Astorga. He is an award-winning full-time professional wildlife photographer based in South Texas. His work is featured in Nature's Best Magazine, Audubon Magazine, National Wildlife Federation Magazine, Texas Parks and Wildlife Magazine, National Geographic Guidebooks, Ranger Rick Magazine, the Chicago Tribune, Quail Unlimited, and other national and regional publications. In 2020, Hector was named one of the We Will Not Be Tamed ambassadors for the Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation. The ambassadors are a group of remarkable Texan outdoorsmen and women who stand together and tell their stories about Texas, the place that has given them so much. He uses his photography for many conservation projects around the state. His love of nature and the outdoors began as a child in his native country, Honduras. He is the ranch manager at the Santa Clara Ranch, a photography ranch that hosts wildlife photographers from all over the globe. He also leads and conducts photography workshops and tours at multiple locations in North, Central, and South America, Scandinavia, and Africa. Please join me in welcoming Hector. So that's all of us silently clapping there, I see. <laughs> so Hector, it's all yours. Thank you, Connie. Thank you for that kind introduction. And thank you uh, for inviting me to talk to you guys today. It's always a pleasure to talk to photo groups throughout the country. Um, glad, glad to be here. So my presentation is about an hour long. Uh, what I do ask is that if you have any questions, I am open to take questions during the presentation. But of course, since you guys are going to be muted, just send the questions through the chat. Uh, I'll have the chat window opening as I'm presenting, so I'll be able to see him. If the question pertains to the slide or the topic that I'm currently on, I'll answer it right there and then. If it does not, we'll answer it after the presentation is, you know, is over. So feel free to ask questions, you know, while I'm while I'm going through the presentation. Okay. So let me get this screen going here, and uh, can everybody see that? Perfect. All righty. Let me just get my chat window open real quick here so I can see if anything comes in. There we are. Perfect. Okay, so this is a talk that I've done before, uh, and uh, it's basically uh, what I, you know, what I do as in terms of field techniques or planning uh, before I go out to photograph. It is becoming a better wildlife photographer. It's called, you know, uh, basically. Um, when I do this live, you know, in, in a real live setting, I always ask everybody, how many of you want to become better wildlife photographers? Raise of hands. And of course, I usually get about pretty close to 100%. We always want to improve our work, right? We always want to get better at what we do, especially something as, you know, something as, you know, as photography that we're all are passionate about. So how do we get there? You know, how do we become better at this craft? I'm going to show you, you know, share with you today some of the things that I've done over the last you know, 15, 16 years of my career to get to where I am today. Um, we're gonna cover some basic stuff and then I'll get into some more you know, planning, field techniques and things like that. So let's cover some of the basics. And this you know, should be kind of a refresher for all of you. Um, but when I'm talking about basics is we need to learn to master the photography triangle. We need to understand what aperture, shutter speed and ISO are and how they work with one another, right? Uh, this is a must for all, you know, for all photographers. We need to know about composition. Uh, composition is the art side of photography. We need to either, you know, follow guidelines to make better compositions. As photographers, we are storytellers. And if we tell a good story with their image, of course, we capture audience. So composition, of course, is a basic that must be learned. We need to understand the correct photo, you know, photo equipment and gear that we need to use. A lot of times I see clients or, you know, people that travel with me and, uh, you know, I always give everybody a list. This is the type of equipment that we're going to be needing. And that's basically understanding, you know, on the subjects that we're going to be targeting, the locations that we're going to be photographing. And of course, uh, knowing what to take out there and what not to take out there, it's a must. And again, this is also basic. Again, this might sign repetitions for you guys, but we'll cover all these topics here shortly. As a wildlife photographer, one of the must things that we need to do, of course, is we need to understand our subjects. We need to know about wildlife behavior. We need to know about seasonal patterns, uh, right? You know, the correct locations where we're going to be targeting these subjects. Uh, if we don't know this, of course, how can we become a good wildlife photographer if we don't understand the behavior or how our subjects are going to be acting? 
And last but not least, of course, practice, practice, practice. Um, photography is very repetitious to get better at it. You know, I can teach you everything from what focal mode to use, you know, how to expose properly. I can tell you how to, you know, what guidelines to follow in composition. But if you're not going out there in the field and you're putting these things that you're learning into practice, they just won't come. And this comes all with repetition, you know, repetition, right? So uh, practice is a huge, huge thing, you know, that, that we must. So when we talk about basics and we're talking about mastering the photography triangle, it's understanding what these three things do and how they work with one another, right? For example, we're looking at an image here that needed to be overexposed because the background was light, you know, there was more light coming from the background than the foreground. Uh, so I needed to overexpose this image. So I needed, you know, depending on the mode that I'm shooting at, if I'm shooting manual mode, aperture mode, or shutter priority mode, not P, don't shoot P and don't shoot auto either. <laughs> but any of the other three, uh, understanding what I need to do to overexpose, right? And for example, if I'm shooting, you know, if I'm shooting manual and I know that I want to shoot this at an F-stop of, let's say, 7.1 to get enough depth of field, I want a shutter speed of let's say uh, you know a thousandth of a second because these cubs were moving so I want to make sure I freeze them and I need to overexpose I would raise my ISO right to overexpose if I'm shooting uh, let's say manual mode with uh, you know auto ISO then I would use my exposure compensation if I was shooting aperture same thing I would be using my exposure compensation so understanding you know how these three things work and how they work with one another is a must same subject, different lighting condition. Here, of course, we have to underexpose a little bit, right? So here, the same thing. If, depending on the on the mode that you like to shoot, some people like to shoot aperture, some people like to shoot full manual or manual with auto ISO. You need to understand how to change, you know, either the aperture or the shutter speed or the ISO to get the exposure that you're after. And again, this is something that we all should know, and we should know it fairly well because it is, you know, it is something I consider the basic in photography. We need to understand how the photography triangle works. Learning composition, right? Composition is what tells our story. It's what captures our audience. Um, follow, you know, follow guidelines. There's a ton of guidelines out there from rule of thirds, leading lines, backgrounds, depth, point of view. These, those are some of the ones that I follow. And of course, there's a ton more. Uh, but, but understanding how these guidelines work and how you tell a better story with your images is how you're going to capture your audience and make your images, you know, go up to a higher level. For example, in this image here, we have a beautiful, let me get a pointer going here. Uh, if I can get this going uh, laser pointer. There we go. We have a nice leading line coming in from the corner, going throughout the whole scene. You know, you can see the juvenile in the back. We have the baby here, and that line ends up where in the mom's face. So that that leading line takes you throughout the whole composition, telling you know telling a better story. We also have a very nice background here that really isolates our subject. Uh, point of view is present here. You know, this is not shot from a vehicle. This is in Kenya, but this is actually at our lodge. So I'm actually laying down on the ground to get this low perspective with them. Um, so again, understanding guidelines and understand, understanding how to put those in place to make better compositions to tell a better story. Uh, same here. We have a, you know, three quail coming in. This is here at the ranch. This is here at home. It's at Santa Clara Ranch. Uh, understanding, you know, perspective, backgrounds, uh, how I want to tell my story here. And what we talked about earlier about the photography triangle, of course, also comes into play here. In this case, I wanted to shoot, you know, I had three quail coming in. They were at dif different distances from me. You know, one was further up, the other two were far, far behind. If I wanted to get these three quail sharp, I would have had to drop down. This is shot with a 600 lens. I would have had to drop to maybe F20, F22. Uh, and what happens to my background when that happens? My background falls apart, right? Because now I no longer blur it. But understanding that, you know, I'm going to compose this this way, my story's still there, even though the other two quail are, are blurred, the story's still there. I have beautiful depth here with this, you know, out of focus foreground, my subject sharp, and of course my background. The point of view is present here. So again, still following my guidelines and understanding how the photography triangle works to get that the field to get a better background is what you know made me you know I was able to create a successful image you know with with this quail coming in correct photo gear and equipment uh having the right lens and camera combination should i use flash should i not use flash i always try to envision the images that i want to take before i take them 
an idea pops up into my head and so okay i want to do this how do i how do i get there how do i create the image that i'm after uh, this is a uh, i believe this is a um lesser violet hum yeah lesser violet hummingbird either that or a or a fiery throat i don't remember but um i wanted to shoot him late in the afternoon with the sun setting behind it and i wanted to show more of the environment than the actual hummer but i needed the hummer to take a lot of the frame in order to show that it's still a hummingbird portrait but I'm trying to showcase where these guys live. This is in Costa Rica, in the highlands. And I shot this with a 12 millimeter lens, 12 to 24 at about 16. Uh, so understanding that, okay, I need a wide angle. I need speed. I'm gonna do it in very low light. This, the sun had already set. So I'm gonna use the camera, my camera that's very good in low light um because i'm going to be shooting this also at a very you know my 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 aperture is going to be small you know stop down because I, I i need depth of field here to show the scene so understanding what i needed and which of my gear was better for it a, a, a camera body that was good in low light a lens that let a lot of light in you know even though i was going to stop down so a 2.8 lens so I shot this, I, I was still shooting Nikon when I shot this. So I shot this with a Nikon D5, which is grading low light. I shot it with a 12 to 24, 28 lens, even though I was shooting that at f20. Uh, and how I positioned myself, you know, to get the shot. I'm literally inches away from the hummingbird feeder as this hummer is coming in and out to feed. The hummer is probably three inches from the lens when I took this shot. That's how you see him so big. And again, shooting it with a 12, with a 12 milliliter. But understanding the right gear that I needed, right? to create the image that I was after. Now, if I show you this a different image, this is a hummingbird shot with a long lens. This is shot with a one to 400. Now here's a totally different technique, right? I'm using multi-flash uh, to freeze the action here, uh, but then understanding the image that I'm after and having the right equipment and the right gear uh, to be able to accomplish it. In this case, I'm using a multi-flash setup. I'm shooting with a one to 400. I'm using a fake background. I'm putting five flashes on these guys and I'm letting the short burst of flash freeze emotion. So both hummingbird shots, but very different gear in order to be able to accomplish them, right? Wildlife behavior is a must as a wildlife photographer. If you don't know what your subjects are gonna do or where to find them or what they're gonna do at a certain type of year, you will never get what you're after. Uh, understanding behavior, what the subjects do, how they act. We don't have the luxury of telling our subjects I missed that. Can you do it again? No, right? You miss it, it's over, and you miss the shot. So understanding behavior, understanding how they're going to react is a must. It's always an educated guess as a wildlife photographer because a lot of times they don't do what we think they're going to do, but most of the time they do. If we have that understanding on how they're going to react, how they're going to behave, gives us a better chance to capture the image that we're after. Also, seasonal patterns. This is a this is a roadrunner during spring when it's mating season, and he's going. He's hearing another roadrunner coming into his territory, so he's going up this limb to get a better view from the top. At the same time, he's displaying and flapping his wings to let the other roadrunner know, "Hey, this is my territory. That female roadrunner down there is my girlfriend. Stay away." Again, understanding that this only happens in the spring. <clears throat> It was, it's when I target this, understanding that if a roadrunner hears another roadrunner and is going to go investigate, he's going to go to a high vantage point. So placing yourself correctly where you think he might go is how you're going to be able to you know, capture the images that you, know, that, that you want. And of course, the right location. This is in Taos, Texas, where we have abundant roadrunners. This is in Kenya. This was uh, a cheetah with her three cubs. Uh, we found her as she was walking down the savanna in, in some grass. And uh, I had my two, you know, my clients in two vehicles and myself. And as we were following her, I noticed that she was in hunting mode, the, 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 the mom, the mom was in hunting mode. And uh, I saw a, uh, you know, we saw that there was some termite mounts coming up, understanding behavior that cheetahs will look for a high vantage point to look either for protection or to look for prey. I told my drivers, guys, we got shots already as they're walking on this grass. Let's move ahead. That way we can position ourselves right. I believe they're going to get on top of that termite mount, or at least on one of those termite mounts coming up. So we moved up, positioned ourselves. Also, again, talking about the right equipment as we, I just did, we all had long lenses. So we had the, the correct distance because we all were shooting 600, 500, 400 lenses, putting ourselves in position to be able to capture the shot. These cats came up as soon as they saw the termite mount. Boom, they went right up. 
Again, it's an educated guess. They could have walked right by it. I'm not going to say it's guaranteed, but knowing that this is what they do and seeing this happening before, we were able to place ourselves in the right location to get the shot. Everything else I've been talking about also applies here, right? A little bit more backlit, so a little bit overexposing, understanding the photography triangle, understanding composition. I have a lot of blurred out foreground, middle ground, background to create depth. But then again, also putting into play, you know, wildlife behavior to create the image. This is in Kenya at the Maasai Mara. And last but not least, practice, practice, practice. One of the things I get the most asked about is birds in flight. I did a talk for Sony, uh, I think it was last year, year before last, I don't remember, where we, uh, where we asked the audience, you know, everybody that signed up, we had them send in questions on what they, uh, you know, on what they wanted to hear, you know, what, what they wanted to, for us to talk about. And uh, so I took 50 questions and I was gonna pick 20 of those questions. And that's what the presentation was gonna be all about. Basically, the, you know, the participants would send the questions in. Out of those 50 questions, 40, were about birds in flight. <laughs> Everybody wants to learn about birds in flight. Now, I can teach you what focus mode to use, what uh, shutter speed, minimum shutter speed you need, depending on the type of bird. If it's a big bird, of course, you don't need as fast if it's a small bird. I can teach you, you know, how to expose in the snow in this case. You know, you're going to overexpose. Also, your white balance is going to change a little bit because you're shooting in snow. I can teach you all that. But if you don't go out there and do it over and over again, that muscle memory to keep this subject in the frame as this bird is flying, not only towards you, but flying from left to right, won't come. I cannot teach muscle memory. That comes from you doing it over and over and over again. And that's what I mean by practice, practice, practice. You can learn in a classroom what you need. You can be told what focus modes and everything that you need, but we cannot teach you how to pan. That comes from you doing it over and over again. And photography is all about that. Composing in camera is all about doing it over and over again. So you start thinking differently when you're looking through your viewfinder. That comes with practice. Uh, people always tell me, oh, but you're so good. Guys, I shoot almost every, I've been shooting almost every day for the last 15 years. It's because I shoot a lot. And I get this question asked a lot. Oh, you, you know, you're, you're leading at the ranch. You've been at the ranch for 10 years. Do you still shoot when you're in the blinds? Aren't you tired of Green Jays? I don't need any more Green Jay shots. I'll give them that. But if I'm sitting in a blind with clients, why will I not shoot? I might not do anything with those images, but I'm panning. I'm trying different things. I'm trying to you know, uh, you know, keep those birds in my viewfinder as they're moving around because that builds practice, that builds muscle memory. And that makes me a better photographer. So practice, of course, is one of the huge, you know, doing this over and over and over again is one of the things that is gonna get you better at our craft. So when you go to a place like Africa, where you're going to have a once in a lifetime, you know, you might be only going out there once and you're going to have a chance to photograph the migration and you have, now you have not only one moving subject, now you have a ton of moving subjects, but you have built that muscle memory and how to pan with a moving subject, you know, because you shot doves all, you know, 20 times a day, you know, back home or whatever, you, or if you live by the beach, go shoot seagulls all day, you already have that muscle memory, you know, in, in you, that when you get to a location where you're going to see something unique, you're going to be able to pan with that subject. You're going to be able to get the image that you're after. And this all comes with practice. You know, panning with, sub, you know, panning with moving subjects is probably one of the diff most difficult things that we do as wildlife photographers, because again, we have to keep, keep the focus. We have to keep the subjects in the frame. We have to make sure that as we move in the light changes, we have to have the right exposure. Because I can be sitting in a, you know, in a blind or in a vehicle, and if I'm pointing my camera right, it's a different exposure than when I pointed my camera to the left. And that comes with doing it over again and understanding it's like, okay, the light change, I need to underexpose, I need to overexpose, right? Depending on the situation. And that comes with you doing it over and over and over again. So practice is a must. So these are the basics, right? We need to understand everything about the triangle, how these three, you know, how aperture, shutter speed, and ISO work with one another and what they do. If you change one, what happens to the other? We need to know about composition to tell a better story, capture your audience. Of course, we have to write, have the correct photo gear. As wildlife photographers, we need to understand what our subjects are gonna be doing or hope we, you know, we, we, we have at least an educated guess what our subjects are gonna be doing, how to be at the right location, how to be out there at the right time. Um, you know, I get clients that come to the ranch in, in, in July, I'm sorry, in, in, um, in November, and they're like, okay, let's go get the painted buntings. They're not here in November, they're only here in spring. So again, understanding seasonal patterns, understanding right locations, right? 
And last, but definitely not least, practice, practice, practice. We have to do this over and over and over again so we can be better at it. And we can start building muscle memory to be able to panel with subjects. We can start thinking about guidelines as we look through the viewfinder. I'm guilty of it too. Sometimes something extraordinary happens. We just point our camera and we start shooting, right? And we forget how to compose or we forget how to, you know, how to expose properly. With mirrorless now, it's a little bit easier now because now I can have a histogram live so I can expose on the fly a little bit easier. Uh, but then again, you know, sometimes, you know, something happens so quick that, you know, you go out there and all you do is shoot and yeah, you caught it, but you blew the whites or you underexposed it. By doing it over and over again, you'll start seeing those, these things as you're shooting and you'll start correcting these things as you're shooting. Field techniques. This is some of the stuff that I do when, before I go out and uh, what, you know, what, um, give me one second here. I lost my chat window. Any questions that come in? Uh, there was one, uh, Hector, on the bird in flight, I think. What were the settings for that shot? Oh, what were the settings on the shot? Uh, sure. The, on, the, on the Golden Eagle, it it's a big bird, so you don't need a whole lot of speed. And that was done in very low light uh, because it was a cloudy day. And uh, so I shot that, I believe, uh, 16 hundredths of a second in terms of shutter speed. And I shot that at f4, uh, I, because the distance from me to the from me to the eagle was, you know, was a good way. So stopping down was not going to do me any good because my depth of field was not going to increase. And by stopping down, of course, being that I'm in very low light, my ISO was going to go higher. Now, in terms of ISO, I don't remember the exact ISO setting, but I'm going to guess it was about 2,000, 2,400 ISO. Uh, but 16 hundredths of a second to uh, to freeze a, a big bird. Okay. Thank you. So field techniques. Um, let me move this here. Use of the appropriate supporting gear. We talked about having the right camera and the right lenses, but what else do we need? I've been out in shoots where, you know, and that I, you know, that we go out and we've all done it. Me, me, you know, I raised my hand here, me, me too that we forget something as simple as a trigger that we might need and it's going to make it easier for us. You know, we go do multi-flash and we forget our trigger or, you know, we're going to do, um, we're going to be, you know, shooting macro and we forget a flash diffuser. Yeah, we can still get the shots, but if we would have had the right equipment, it would have been easier and would have created better shots. So understanding not only what camera and what lens we need, but also understanding what kind of supporting gear we need makes us better at our craft. This is shot in South Africa. This is Simanga uh, Game Reserve, where we use some night heights. This is not flashed. A flash is not allowed because flash will scare the subject. This is lit up with some LED lights that are placed on each side of the blind. This is shot with a 12, no, I'm sorry. This is shot with a 24 to 70. These cats are literally 10 feet in front of me. That's how close they get. The water hole is very small. I'm on one side of the, hall, of the water hole in a sunken blind as you know as, as as the as the subjects come to drink so understanding that okay i can't use flash i'm only going to be able to use the available light which is not very strong i'm shooting back to what i talked about i'm shooting with a camera that's very good in low light i'm shooting a 28 lens but i cannot crank up the speed too much because if i crank up the speed to 1600 1250 what happens to my iso here it just skyrockets right so I need to have some kind of support to help me keep the camera steady. In this case, I use the tripod, but I'm using a short lens that does not have a lens collar. And I learned this the hard way. That's why I included this image because guess what I forgot? I took the tripod, I took my camera and I took my 24 to 70, but I didn't have a camera plate. <laughs> so I couldn't put the camera on the tripod because I had nowhere to hold it to because my 24 to 70 doesn't have a lens collar. I'm so used to using my tripod with my 600, my 1 to 400 that has a lens collar. In this case, I didn't have a lens collar. So I basically just opened up the, you know, the, the I put the tripod there and I leaned it on the tripod, which is not the ideal thing to do, but it's the only thing I had. And I struggled. Now I was able to get the shot, but if I would have been able to have a better support, it would have been easier for me. Uh, but again, understanding that something as simple as a camera plate, I forgot to take a camera plate to the blind with me that night and that I struggle with it. So understanding, okay, this is what I need and plan. If we plan accordingly, you know, you know, this is, you know, you will have the right gear that you need. I can't tell you how many times I've been in the field that I've forgotten something and I've struggled the entire day. So I do it too. I mean, I'm, I'm guilty at this too. And we all are. I've been in photo shoots where we show up and a client forgets to bring a tripod 
and we're going to be fan, you know, we're going to be sitting in the blind for four hours shooting with a long lens with no tripod. Of course, they're going to struggle because within an hour they'll be tired of hand holding that lens with no support. So understanding the, you know, the supporting gear that you need to be able to get the images that you want. This is in Costa Rica. We're shooting bats at night with multi flash. Um, we basically set the cameras in a plane of focus. The flower, you know, the bats hit the flower. If it's a good night, every three, four seconds, we're using, you know, we're using four flashes to light these guys up. So I know I need my four flashes. I know I need a trigger, which basically is going to trigger with the radio frequency is going to trigger my flashes. But something as simple as a cable release makes this easier because if I have to hit the shutter with my finger, what happens with the camera? It moves a little bit, right? Not only that, your reaction time is not as fast. These guys hit the flower and out in a matter of a seconds. With a cable release, as soon as I see something move, I start shooting. <laughs> if I don't have a cable release, yes, I might still get some shots, but I'm not going to get as many keepers as I am if I had one. So something as simple as a cable release, when you're going out to do a certain type of shoot, will help you get, you know, get the images that you're after and will make it easier for you. I'm not saying you won't get anything, but you, it'll make it easier for you and you might have a better keeper rate. Staying in Costa Rica, this is done with macro. This is a macro shot, uh, 100 millimeter, 105 macro. Uh, this is flashed. You know, we were using flash to light them up. But what am I using here that's helping with, with the image? My flash has a diffuser on it. I have a softbox on top of my flash. How far away am I from this frog when I'm shooting him with a macro lens? I'm literally about seven to eight inches away. I'm very, very close. So if my flash has no diffuser, what would I have right here? Can y'all see? Can y'all see my cursor there? What would I have right in this? Let me get the pointer again. What would I have right there if my flash did not have a diffuser? I would have hot spots, right? Glare, correct. Hot spots, glare. Uh, bright spot, perfect. The diffuser takes that away. It spreads the light more evenly. So by having a diffuser, I get better shots. And, and I'm using a $12 diffuser from, from, you know, from Hunt's Photo. <laughs> I'm not telling you. And again, it's just that simple piece of equipment that gives me better images, right? So again, understanding not only the lens, the correct lens. In this case, of course, we talked about earlier, having the correct lens, having the correct camera. I'm using a very high resolution camera here. I believe this was shot with the A7R4, you know, 51 megapixel camera, uh, which is great if you have control lighting conditions. I'm using my 105 2.8 macro lens, which is a fantastic macro lens. That helps me get the image. But what really makes the image stand out is that diffuser that's on my flash that I can diffuse the light and take away all those hot spots you know, because I am so close to the subject. This is another macro shot. Now this macro shot is natural light. There's no flash here. This is a spider. Uh, um, these are green links, green link spider here in South Texas. This here at the ranch. This guy is tiny. This guy's about the size of my pinky nail. And he's on top of a lantana bud, a one lantana bud. That tells you how small this guy yeah. is. This is shot with a 200 macro. This is all natural light, no flash here. But what did I use to light him up? I had a reflector disc. So I was using, because it was you know, in the middle of the day, the light was coming. It was low light. It was you know, late afternoon. But I needed to put light on the bottom. So I used a reflector disc to light them up from the bottom. And not only did I use a reflector disc, I used a reflector disc that was gold to give it a more yellowish, nicer, you know, golden type light reflecting on the subject. Um, again, this is, this is an old image. I shot this, I think, 2013, 2013 or 14. I don't remember. Um, shot with a 200 macro. Um, I was still shooting Nikon back then. And uh, again, I used the diffuser to be able to get enough light on the on the lantana button on the subject to get that nice even light on the, you know, on, on the spider. Uh, lovely thing. You know, one of the great things I love about macro is that, you know, this is stuff that you don't see with your naked eye. You know, if you see the spiders are so small, but once you get in there with a the macro, you can see all the little hairs and their legs and how neat they are. Um, and you can create some fantastic images, you know, by by going, you know, by going, um, you know, this close to such such small subjects. This image did really well. This image won best of showing Nampa in 2016 or 17. I don't remember, but it did win best of show in the Nampa showcase a few years back. In the in the macro category. Right point of view. Use of blinds and hides. Learn to work the location. 
understanding what you're going to be up against if you're shooting from a vehicle. In other words, if your vehicle is your blind. Um, I always tell everybody, when you go to a location, you will always get better shots the second time around in that location than the first time around. Why is that? Because you're going to take shots from that location. You're going to go back and you're going to say, you know what? This is good. But if I would have gone a little lower, if I would have done this, where would have done that? The next time you go back, you're going to get better images because you worked that location before. And now you're going to know how to position yourself properly to get the shot that you're after. Um, for those of you that have been to the ranch with me, why are the blinds at the ranch four feet into the ground? Perspective. When you're sitting in our blinds and your lens sticks out of our blind, your, your lens is literally two inches off the ground. So you can get that low angle perspective when you're shooting subjects coming into the water holes or coming into the shooting areas where we photograph here. It's all about perspective. So going to a location and having, you know, and, and, and knowing where do you need to put yourself to be able to get, you know, to get the images that you're after. When I go to the beach, South Padre Island is the closest to me here. And that's where I photograph all my shorebirds. Um, of course, it's the closest, about an hour and a half away from me. Uh, and there's the birding center, which is great for birders, not for photographers. And there's also the mud flats, which very few people go. Mostly fishermen go to the mud flats, not, not many photographers. Why don't I go to the birding center? Because I'm shooting from a boardwalk down at my subject. I don't like the perspective. When I go to the mud flats, I take my, I take my ground pod. Talked about you know accessories, right? I make sure I have my ground pod because I'm going to be laying at water sedge in that muck that smells horrible, so I can get this perspective, so I can get this type shots. And if I'm lucky enough to have a day that has no wind when the water is glass, and I'm shooting into the bay where the background is literally 15 miles away, I can get these seamless water to sky shots. And again, it was a no, wind, you know, it was a no wind day, so I get the water like glass, and it's all about learning how to position yourself there. Because if I sit up, two things happen: one, I don't get the angle, and two, nothing gets close to me. By laying down on my stomach, and yes, it hurts, and your neck will hurt for three days afterwards if you spend four hours out there. Um, but it's all about positioning yourself properly to to get the image that you're after, right? Uh, having the right gear, like we just talked about. In this case, I'm using a ground pod, so my lens is right at water level. I'm laying down low that the birds come up close to me because they probably think I'm a log. I'm not a threat to them. As soon as I sit up, they all leave because now I'm a threat to them. So not only is getting the right perspective, but also getting the right conditions that you're not a threat to the subject. You're not going to spook him and he's going to be able to come closer. You can fill the frame, even though you're shooting a long lens. This is shot with a 500. Um, but again, perspective, knowing how to work that location. When we photograph you know, uh, game subjects, game animals, uh, deer, elk, uh, moose, you know, um, anything with antlers, basically. Where do we want to be? Higher than them, eye level, or lower? I want to be lower. Why? It makes them look bigger. And what we're trying to showcase here is not only a fantastic, beautiful subject here, but we want to show how big that those antlers are. And you get that by shooting up at them. So this is shot with a little pop-up blind, but my little pop-up blind not only has the window that it comes with, I also cut out by the dirt, you know, about three inches off the ground. I cut out a hole that I can lay down inside my pop-up and I can stick my lens out four inches off the ground and get this perspective of shooting up at the subject versus shooting down at them, right? It makes them look bigger. Not only does it make them look bigger, I can create depth, right? I have a beautiful, soft, muted, a uh, soft, uh, out of focus foreground. My subject's perfectly sharp, a nice blurred out background. I'm creating depth, which is a great compositional guideline. Um, the background is totally blurred because I'm shooting it, you know, I'm shooting it fairly, you know, I think I shot this at 6.3 or 5.6 uh, with a 600 or a 400. I don't remember one of the two. So my background blurs real nicely. So I'm creating, I'm also have a good background, which is also a good compositional guideline. The image loses some of the two dimensionality of it. You know, photography is two dimensions, but anything we can do in composition that make it look more 3D, which is what we saw, makes a better composition, makes a better image. And that all comes with positioning yourself properly, getting low, right? In this case, getting really low, shoot up at him to make this buck look bigger. And of course, I was very lucky that I had beautiful light that afternoon or that morning. This was a morning shot, if I remember correctly.
I just showed you an example of getting low. Here's an example of getting high. This is in South Africa. I actually stood up on the vehicle to be able to get at eye level with the elephant. Because um, I wanted from below, you, you could see the eye, but it was, not as, it was not as neat. So basically what I did here is the opposite. The perspective, the better perspective was a higher perspective. So the vehicles in South Africa, those vehicles don't have a roof. Those vehicles are totally open. So I basically stood up and if I remember correctly, I might've even, I might've even gotten on top of the chair or the top of the seat to get a little bit higher. Uh, this is shot with a one or 400, um, got up and the whole perspective shows this elephant, you know, all this dust flying and he's not really walking towards me. <laughs> it kind of looks that way, but what he's doing, there was some little plants that he was actually hitting with his foot because he wanted to eat them. And as he's hitting them, of course, all this dust is, all this white dust is flying. And um, I wanted to get a tight, you know, shot of him. But again, I wanted to be at eye level with him. So in this case, versus being slow, I went high. So sometimes depending on the situation, and of course, depending on the subject, you're going to have a better perspective, either high or low, or sometimes right at eye level. In this case, I'm right at eye level. I couldn't get any higher because that's the size I would go. So I was able to get at least eye level with him so I can get the shot here. Learn your gear. Use your you know, learn how to work your camera body and your lens combination. And what I'm talking about, this is something I just, I covered earlier. I covered a muscle memory, right? Um, I'm going to stop sharing this. I want you guys to see me real quick. Can you all see me there? And I'll bring it back again. I see this a lot and I'm guilty of it too sometimes. We'll be in the field and I'll tell my clients, guys, we need to overexpose this. Overexpose one stop. You need one sixteen hundredths of a second and shoot this at F8 so you get enough depth of field. We have a bird coming at us or we have something coming at us. And my clients will do this. They'll pull their camera and they don't have their glasses on. And they'll put their glasses on. And they'll start fidgeting with the back of the camera. Hector, did you say F8 or F4? It's over. The bird is gone. The subject's gone. I mean, you, you don't, we don't have that luxury as wildlife photographers, right? Uh, <laughs> and I mean, I'm guilty of it too, guys. I'm not, you know, I'm not making fun of everybody because I do it too sometimes. You know, sometimes, you know, you forget how to do something. But, um, you know, we have to, we have to be able to use our cameras without even thinking. We have to build the muscle memory that with our three fingers, the finger that controls the front wheel and the two back wheels. I know, for example, the way my cameras are set up, if I need to change my f-stop, I know that my front finger, my index finger needs to turn clockwise to stop down. It needs to go counterclockwise to widen up my aperture because I control my aperture with my front finger. If I need to speed up my camera, my back thumb, which controls my back wheel, I go counterclockwise to speed up, I go clockwise to slow down. And then my back wheel, my other back wheel on my, on my Sony camera controls my ISO. Same thing, if I'm going counterclockwise, ISO goes down. If I'm going clockwise, ISO goes up. This needs to happen without you thinking about it, without, okay, F-stop, automatically, that finger needs to move. I need to speed up, automatically, my thumb needs to start turning that wheel. I need to overexpose. I need to crank up that ISO or, or you know, whichever way you're shooting, depending if you're shooting manual aperture or whatever way you shoot. But you have to be able to do it on the fly and without even thinking about it because our subjects don't give us a second chance. And what is the one luxury that we do not have as wildlife photographers? Time. Things happen in seconds and then it's over. And then you don't, if you don't, if you're not prepared, if you don't get it right, you're not going to get it. So again, learn your cameras. One of the things, and this is not a plug-in for Sony, but one of the things I love about my Sony cameras, I've owned three different models. All the buttons are in the same spot. So once I learn one, all my cameras are the same. When I was shooting, you know, when I was shooting some of the other brands, every, every camera out there had different buttons, you know, even though they're the same brand. So you would, you would, you know, you would finally build that muscle memory on which finger or which button to move. And then you switch to another body. And what you think is over and under is record for a video. And you hit it and then you start recording video and of course you missed it. So again, learn your cameras, you know, learn what the buttons do without even thinking about it. Learn how your wheels work without even thinking about it. And it don't matter how you set up your wheels, you set them up to whatever works for you. But again, learn it and know how to use them without thinking about it. 
Uh, question, do you use auto ISO? Yes, I do. I do use auto ISO now. Uh, to, I shoot manual and I shoot both full manual with set ISO and I shoot uh, manual with auto ISO. The reason I like auto ISO is because if the light changes, it'll get me a little bit closer to where I need to be. I'll still adjust it in the end because I'm always exposing with my histogram. I always have the live histogram in my viewfinder now that I shoot mirrorless. So auto ISO gets me closer. So my adjustment in my over and under or in my shutter speed might be a couple clicks versus six or nine clicks, because again, the ISO will compensate if I lose light or if I increase light. So yes, I do use auto ISO. And again, it depends on the circumstance. There are gonna be some circumstances that I'm not gonna use auto ISO. And there's gonna be some circumstances that I'm gonna shoot aperture mode. So uh, for example, I, when I shoot, when I, sh I don't do much landscape work, but when I do landscape work, I shoot aperture mode. So it all depends on which circumstances and what it is that I'm shooting. So yes, I do use auto ISO. So for example, this is here at the ranch. We were photographing perch birds, and we saw this. I saw this bronze cowbird, and all of a sudden, female bronze cowbird showed up. He went over to her. He started puffing up, and I knew instantly this guy's going to start to display. My shutter speed was one over three twenty because I'm doing perch birds. This guy goes up, starts hovering over her, and this lasts what, maybe seven, eight seconds, if if that. Instantly. My thumb started turning to be able to get me at 3,200 of a second. I started cranking up the, I started, you know, I, I was shooting at F7.1. If I went up that high, 7.1, I knew that my ISO was going to skyrocket. So I started stopping down some because I'm okay that the female is a little off, you know, not totally, totally sharp. And my male, which is the most important of the, of the, of the, of the shot here is totally sharp because my story's still there, right? It's obvious that this male is displaying for this female. So I'm okay with her being, a little soft because it gave me a better ISO and it gave me a better background. But this happened in a matter of five, six seconds. If I did not know how to turn those dials to get me where I needed to be, I would have never been able to get this shot. Not only that, I was shooting horizontal. I had to also go vertical, right? Uh, again, instantly, without even thinking, start turning those wheels to get you where you need to be. It's a must for wildlife photographers. If you're taking to think about something you're going to start you know you are going to miss shots and again i'm guilty of it too i'm not saying i'm perfect but the more i practice the more the better i get at them the less shots are going to, i'm going to be missing same thing with this roadrunner here's a roadrunner at the ranch screaming across the water hole in front of me do you shoot wide open and crop on these shots i crop very little because most of my shooting is from blinds or from controlled conditions I shoot from blinds or I position the vehicles properly when I'm shooting out a vehicle or if I'm shooting from a deck, how I place my purchase or whatever. So I usually have the right lens combination to, to, get the, you know, to get the image right on camera. I do crop sometimes to correct the horizon or maybe it was just a little tight, but I try to always get it more in camera. Uh, so no, I don't shoot wide. And the reason I don't like to shoot wide is I love clean backgrounds. In order for me to shoot wide, I would have to not use my 600. I would have to use my one to 400, right? And I don't get the backgrounds I get on the 600 with the 1 of 400. So I'm shooting wider. I'm not getting the backgrounds I need because I'm using less focal uh, length. So no, I don't, I don't shoot wide and crop. I don't, I don't believe in that. Now, there's going to be some instances that you have to, but I try not to. In this case, uh, again, Roadrunner screaming across. Thing that popped in, I have a million Roadrunner shots. So I said, you know what? I'll do something different. I want to do a slow shutter panel with this guy. So instantly, I slow down my camera to 1 over 120. As I'm slowing my camera that slow, what happens with my ISO? My ISO starts to drop, and it gets to 100, and it can't go any lower, so I start blowing the whites. So I know that I need to stop down too, right, to, to not let as much light in. So from F4, I went to F8, shut, you know, slower shutter speed. I think I was shooting auto ISO. The ISO bottomed out at 100, but again, I was able to change my f-stop as well. And as this roadrunner went through, I was able to do a burst. If I would have stopped to think about all this or, okay, how do I change this? Or how do I move this? I would have never gotten this shot, right? He ran across maybe twice and then it was over. He never came back or he just stayed on the side. He just didn't run across. He was chasing butterflies. It was fun. And you'll see another shot from this day or a little bit later on the, on the presentation. Um, but again, knowing what you're after and knowing what you know, what you need, and knowing how to set it instantly without thinking, shutter speed instantly, counterclockwise thumb wheel, without even thinking about it. I know that this thumb needs to do it, 
And that comes with what I talked about earlier, right? Practice, practice, practice. Um, the first time I went out there, yes, I stopped and I looked on how to change my shutter speed. Now I've done it so much that it's all automatic. That muscle memory, that mental muscle memory is there. This was in Kenya a few years back. We were photographing some, uh, we were photographing some, uh, what you call it, um, ostriches. And all of a sudden, one of my drivers looks at me, he goes, sit down, we got to go. So I yelled at everybody, everybody down, we're moving. I didn't even know what it was doing, but if he says sit down, we got to go, it means it's something good. He got something on the radio, right? So we all sit down, we start booking it. And as we're going, I ask him, what's up? And he goes, we got a chewy, a leopard on a kill, or a chewy just took down a kill. All right, great. So we're hauling, you know, down the road. We make this turn and this is what greets us. What can you tell about this image? 110% backlit. The sun was in her face. Instantly, I, need, I knew I had to overexpose. So that's the first thing I yelled out. Overexpose, at least two stops. Every camera is different, so I cannot give you exact settings. But I, I said overexpose, at least two stops. Because it was totally backlit. I could barely see him because the sun was right in her face. Overexpose. I think it was a stop, stop and a half somewhere on there. Got the shot. This leopard stayed with this with this kill, this, this impala there where you see it right there. Maybe 20 seconds, but then eventually just picked it up and put it in a ditch. And that was it. We never saw the kill again. We saw the leopard because the leopard kept moving, but we never saw the kill again because he hit it in a ditch. Understanding the photography triangle we talked about earlier and understanding how to change my settings right and how to change them on the fly without even thinking about it we were able to get shots like this. Because if, if I would have been fidgeting with the exposure and I would have shot, let's say, at zero, I would have gotten a what? I would have gotten a silhouette, right? Because the light's coming completely from the wrong side. It's coming from, not the wrong side. Backlighting is gorgeous. It's coming from the backside. So you just need to adjust property to get the shot that you want. We had the sun in our face here, but that's where the cat was and that's where the road was. So we couldn't, we didn't have the luxury to go around it, right? So again, understanding how to change it and, you know, shooting, um, if I'm shooting from a vehicle, I use a bean bag when I shoot from a vehicle all the time. Uh, a monopod, you know, you can. I'm not a big fan of shooting with a monopod inside a vehicle. So I use, uh, me personally, I shoot with a bean bag from a vehicle all the time. Sometimes I'll use a monopod to stick the camera out the window and kind of hold it <laughs> so I can get a lower angle, but not to, not to steady it. I use a bean bag to steady my camera when I'm shooting from a vehicle. Now, this guy gave me a little bit more time. It's a slot. They're not very fast. <laughs> but still, I mean, the slot came down. Uh, I there was another, another vine or another branch that I was hoping she would come down because it would have separated her more from the background. Unfortunately, I, don't, I can't control. Uh, how big a bean bag depends on the size of the, 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 of the lens that you're using. I use a big bean bag because I mostly shoot with my 600. So I'm using a very big lens. Would you use spot metering to address the need for exposure comp? No, I shoot everything matrix metering. And now that I shoot mirrorless, I shoot, I expose with my histogram. I have a live histogram on my camera at all times and that's how I expose. So I shoot everything matrix because I don't care. All I care about is placing the data to the right side without blowing the whites. So I shoot every, everything, and I mean everything with matrix metering by using a live histogram on my viewfinder. That's how I expose nowadays. Um, how big a beanbag again, depends on the size of the lens. I use a big one because I shoot mostly with my 600 and my 400 uh, prime lenses. Those are big, big lenses. In this case, I couldn't blur the background enough because she was really close to it, but she was lighter than the background. So I decided to expose for the white, knowing well that the background would go, will go black. Again, still using my histogram to make sure that I push my whites as far as I could. And then in post, I can always work in highlights and shadows so I can make the background a little bit darker to make her isolate more. But then again, on the fly, right? Understanding that I need to change this quickly because she's going to go down this vine and then it's over. Uh, understanding, you know, back to the basics, understanding the photography triangle. I have a lighter subject on the back background. Now I don't have to overexpose. Now I have to underexpose, right? Doing high key images, same thing, understanding that you have to overexpose. This, this was very, very high key. It was a very cloudy day. Uh, this is in Kenya as well. Um, and we had a very, you know, totally, totally white sky. No blue whatsoever. It was very cloudy, no, no sun, kind of flat light a little bit. Um, 
So I decided to do high key. And then of course I converted it in black and white in post. Here's an example of the same mom and, and giraffe. Now this is in color, but you can see the sky here. It, we had just, you know, a very, very, very white sky, total, total cloudy day. Uh, but then again, you know, as wildlife photographers, we don't have the luxury to pick our weather, right? We get what we have. So understanding how to shoot in the weather conditions that we're given uh, also comes into play here. But again, understanding that I needed to overexpose and doing it on the fly because she came down, she licked the baby a couple of times and then she went back up and that was it. She didn't do it again. So being able to set those parameters right, set the exposure correctly as she did this, doing it quickly, because if I would have been there, you know, playing with it, I would have not gotten the shot. Going from shooting perch birds to doing four thousands of a second shutter speeds. Uh, I was shooting these uh, white-throated bee eaters in South Africa. I had these beautiful perches where they were coming in and all of a sudden they started flying and catching wasps. And they would catch the wasp and they would take off. So I went from one over two fifties of a second to one over four thousandths of a second. And uh, being able to switch that quickly to catch, you know, to catch them as they were catching these wasps. Um, I was able to capture a couple of them. Um, I missed a lot of them too. You know, it's hard. This is not easy. But uh, but again, being able to dial in the settings quickly gave gave me better, you know, more opportunities to to be able to to be able to catch it. Last and definitely not least, field ethics and etiquette, blend in, leave no trace, respect location and others, and plan ahead. If you're putting yourself or your subject in danger. So not worth it. This is the elk rut in, in Jasper National Park in, in Canada. Um, the only, I, I do a lot of talks for elementary kids and things like that, that I've, that I've done for Texas Parks and Wildlife. And I've done some here in my local school that they've asked me to talk. And one of the things kids always ask me is, have you ever been afraid that you're going to die? And no, I never have. But the one time that I was really afraid was the time that a bull elk charged me in Jasper National Park. Luckily, I had a little wall next to me and I was able to jump the wall and this bull elk came right, not this one, but another one. So again, understanding your subjects, never put yourself in danger, never put your subjects in danger, keep the correct distance. This is shot with a 600 lens. I am a long way away. This is a big bull elk. That gives, and, and I think I cropped this one a little bit, but this is shot with a 600 so I can keep my distance. I'm not, a, I'm not approaching him. I'm not putting myself in danger. I'm not putting the animal in danger. And if this guy decides to come my way, I have a barrier next to me that I can get behind uh, and I'm not disturbing his behavior. These guys are rutting they're rut crazy, they're bugling, they're, they're fighting between themselves, they're protecting their harems. Um, so again, understanding where you need to, everything we've talked about, right? How to do it. Like release or like wireless remote. What are you, what are we talking about here, Chris? Um, I can answer that after the presentation if you like. Um, so again, never putting yourself in danger, never putting your subject in danger. It's just not worth it, right? Also, um, understanding that these subjects need space. Uh, these subjects, you know, in order to capture some of the behavior, they, they're not going to do it if we're right on top of them. Um, you have to be able to give them space. You have to be able to respect their space, respect the subject, and respect the habitat too, right? Uh, and again, never put yourself in danger at all times. This this image here, you can see this image here of the four pumas. This is in Torres del Paine in Chile. I shot this. Uh, this was a few years back. This was not this year. This was maybe four, five years ago. This was shot with a 500 lens. That tells that gives you an idea how far away I am from them. Uh, Andy, do you use custom shooting modes and customize? No, I do not. I'm old school. I uh, I shoot manual mode and I change my wheels to whatever shutter speed and f-stop I need. Um, I get confused with all these custom buttons nowadays that these cameras have. I am old school. I like to, I like to dial in what I need. Uh, so in that aspect, people always ask me, do you, you know, how do I set the custom modes? I don't know because I don't use them. <laughs> so because I'm, I'm very old school in that sense that I like to set everything myself on the fly. Um, Remotely activate shutter. Oh God, there's a ton of brands out there, uh, Chris. Uh, from the brand names, you know, if you're if you're shooting Nikon, Canon, or Sony, you can buy the their brand name remote shutters, or you can buy the third party ones. Um, I think the one I have, and I don't use it much, is uh, it's it's just a you know it's it's not a brand name. It's just a, a 
Venmo or one of those brands. I mean, I don't remember. Not Venmo. What's it called? Uh, Benro or some one of those different brands that it's not. Uh, it's not a Sony brand. Uh, you know, remote remote shutter. It's just a, a third party brand. So again, you know, we talked about this earlier. You know, the reason I'm able to get so close to these subjects when I'm, you know, at at the bay here in Texas is because I'm laying down on the ground and I look like a log. I'm not a to them. They'll come, and sometimes we have to give them their space, and we have to we have to be patient, folks. I have clients, you know, or people that have come to the ranch that have no patience. And <laughs> it, patience, it's it's as a wildlife photographer, it's one of the things that you have to have the most. Things don't happen instantly. You have to sit there. You know, I remember the first time I got up, I wanted to photograph an owl in flight at night, at night, pitch black. And uh, I set it all up. I knew how I, I thought I knew what I was doing. This was a long time ago. This was maybe 10 years ago. It took me two months of going out almost every night to get the shot that I wanted. Uh, put in the time. Always, you know, always place yourself in a situation where you're not going to affect the subject, where you're going to be able to capture behavior, where the subject is not afraid of you. You can see it. I've seen images. People tell me, oh, look at this image. It's great. The, the subject's stressed out. I can see it. Uh, yes, it's a good image. Yes, you know, it's, it's some kind of behavior. But if the image is stressed out, to me, it's just not worth it. So again, respect your subjects, respect the, you know, respect the place that you're at, leave no trace. You know, I'm a big believer in that. How good are today's cameras intelligent auto exposure? Eh, they're getting better. Um, you know, some are okay. Uh, I, I like to do it myself. And one of the main reasons I, sh I, I switched from, from DSLRs to, to mirrorless a few years back when I did the switch was because I can have a live histogram and I expose 100% of the time with my histogram. I'm always looking at it to expose. So uh, I don't use them. I just, I, I just do the exposure myself by using the histogram. So field techniques, use the appropriate supporting gear, right point of view, um, learn your gear, <laughs> that's a big one. And of course, remember field ethics and etiquette. And lastly, and this is gonna be short, we're almost out of time here, but planning ahead. Um, I always go, oops, I got ahead of me there, sorry. Oh, there we go. I always go with a specific target in mind when I go out by myself, not when I'm on a workshop or not when I'm at the ranch, because that's a more of an overall type shoot. But when I go to shoot for myself, I have a target and an image in mind that I want to create. And I will put all my efforts towards that. When we're in Chile and we're photographing Pumas, I get clients that, oh, look at that bird. Let's photograph that. After. We're after Pumas. Puma trip. <laughs> we have this saying over there because everybody, oh, look at the flamingos. Puma trip. Flamingos later. Target your subjects. Target your subjects. Uh, if you target your subjects, you target the images that you're after, you're going to come back with better images. You're going to be a better photographer. Uh, if you go out there just trying to see what happens, what shows up, oh, I'm going to shoot at everything. Yeah, you might get lucky, but you're going to come back. You're going to have better results if you target your subjects, you target the images that you're after. Uh, my logo is called Discover, Capture, Create, because I believe, I believe we don't take photos. I believe we create them. And that's all about planning ahead and envisioning the image that we want to create and then going out into the field and doing it. Um, I, I just got back from this workshop. Now, this image is a couple of years back old, but I just got back from this workshop. And uh, one of the things that we target is we target these guys crabbing, you know, uh, whooping cranes. They winter here in, 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 in South Texas, about three hours north of me. And they're here for the, you know, they're here for the crabs, for the blue crabs. And um, one of the things I'm always after is, you know, targeting, crab, targeting as they're fishing. So that day we were going out and um, this, I think I was by myself this day. I didn't have any clients. I was just me and, and Kevin, our boat captain. And I told Kevin, Kevin, let's ignore everything else. All I want to do is target them crabbing. So if we see a pair in the field or if we see a, a pair, you know, doing their thing or a colt, you know, when, when they're young, I don't care about that. I want them crabbing. So we ignored everything that day till we found a group of them crabbing. And we just concentrated all our efforts into staying with them that morning. And we were able to, I was able to create some really, really neat images of them coming up with the crabs as they were catching them, as they're breaking them apart, you know. Uh, and again, very target specific of me going out there. Now, I don't do that with clients on a workshop because, of course, we're there for a little bit of everything. Uh, but when I go out by myself, I really am very target specific. Unless a client tells me if I have a private client, says, this is what I want to do, then yes, we will target that. Um, 
Sorry for those of you that don't like snakes. I love snakes. <laughs> for all of you, for those of you that know me, you all know that I love handling snakes. I love photographing snakes. Uh, this is a Western Diamondback here at the ranch. And again, I went out with the fish. I mean, it's not every time of year that we have nice green grass here, you know, or green, you know, uh, ground cover because most of them are, they were very dry here. So it's mostly brown. So I had this really beautiful, you know, patch of green grass. And I knew that if I found a rattlesnake, I was going to photograph them there. So I went with this image, you know, in vision. I wanted to use a long lens so I can get a lot of depth to this image. Uh, this was shot with a 400. So I have a beautiful blurred out foreground grass leading up to the, you know, extremely sharp head tongue snake. And of course, you know, the rattler to show that it is a rattlesnake. And again, that beautiful blurred out background to make, you know, to make the, to make the subject really stand out. So again, I went out with this image in vision and uh, I put it in practice and I was able to create the images that I was after. Um, this is here also at the ranch at one of our water holes. In the fall, we get the big cubbies of quail coming in. In the spring, we don't. In the spring, all they care about is pairing up and fighting. The males fight a lot. But in the fall, they pair up to uh, how close on the rattlesnake for safety. Uh, the way I, well, Again, I've been handling snakes since I was 14, 15 years old. So I'm very comfortable with them. I respect them 100%. I'm very comfortable with them. But if I'm with a client, I will always triple the striking distance. So if the striking distance is three feet. I will not put a client any closer than nine feet. If I'm by myself, depends on the snake. Some snakes I can get really close. Some snakes I do not. I look at the behavior, how they're acting and all that. Uh, so on this shot that you just saw right there, that was shot with a 400. So I'm not very close. I'm probably five feet away, five, six feet away. Um, back to this image, when I got to the water hole, my, my, my ranch hands had already told me that there was a lot of quail showing up at that water hole. So the way I set up that water hole that day was for just quail. I wanted reflection shots and I was hoping that I would get a big cubby coming in so I can get them all drinking with a pretty reflection. I didn't set up any purchase for any of the other birds. I strictly set up for this. So yes, I had cardinals, green jays, all the other stuff show up, but I didn't have a single perch out there for them. All I was interested in is getting quail shots. When these guys showed up, I, my backgrounds were clean. I didn't have any perch holders or any little tripods holding up perches. I was able to get a, a nice clean shot of these. all these quail came up to drink. And I was lucky enough that they all lined up perfectly for me. But then again, very targeted. You know, this is what I went for that day. We talked about this already, but of course, you know, when you're planning, it's all big time when you're planning, have the right and body lens combination. So when you do go out there, and you know that you're going to be shooting at a location that's very dark. This is in Uganda, the mountain gorillas, where the light is almost non-existent some days. I'm shooting with a 7200 2.8 lens, and I'm shooting it, I would say, 90% of the time in 2.8, because again, the light is very, very low. So understanding the location, planning ahead before you go to the location so you can get the shot that you're after. Also slots in thick canopy, very little light. These guys don't move very fast, so you don't need a lot of shutter speed. But then again, going out there with two eight very fast wide aperture lenses. Um, again, kind of combining what you know what I targeted and what I went out with. I I uh, wanted to get some really tight close shots of the king vultures in Costa Rica, so I went out with a six hundred and a two x converter uh, to be able to really really get tight on these guys. So again, planned ahead, had the right equipment to go after the images that I was after. Always plan for inclement weather because, again, you know, as you all know, weather is not something we can control. And, you know, in Costa Rica, Colombia, people ask me the time, what happens if it rains? It rains <laughs> and we shoot in the rain. Can't control it. We're, you're not going to go halfway around the world and say, oh, it's raining. I'm not going out today. No, no. It rains. It, you shoot in the rain. It, you know, and uh, you learn how to work it. Work the conditions. Learn how to work the conditions that you're given. In this case, slowing the camera enough to get some nice, you know, water streaks versus just dots. It depends what you're after. Dots are also pretty. You know, if I wanted dots, I would sped up the camera. I wanted more of streaks. So, of course, I slowed down the shutter speed. The bird was perched. I didn't need a whole lot of shutter speed to freeze the subject, but I wanted to blur the, you know, the, the rain. So, again, slower shutter speed. Learn to work with the conditions that you're given. Totally cloudy day, minimalistic shot, high key, um, flat light. So again, high key, using a, a long lens to create a minimalistic type shot. Again, working that conditions that you're given. I love foggy days when I'm shooting deer. 
I don't know what it is, but anytime I get a deer shot or any kind of, you know, game animal in fog, like elk or, or moose or anything, I love them. Uh, I really, really like them. And I like to, and, you know, I like to shoot it with settings that actually enhance the fog or I'll use, I'll use uh, the haze in post the other way to make it more hazy, to make it, to make the fog really come out. Uh, but then again, learning to work with the conditions that you're given, right? And last but not least, if you're not having fun, why are we even doing this? <laughs> uh, you cannot create good images if you're mad out there. You just can't have it. And we all, you know, we always, we always, um, is, in Costa Rica, is there room for a 7200? Yeah, you know, you can do, you know, like the sloths and some of the bigger things with a 7200. But really, Costa Rica is more of a long lens uh, locate, you know, long lens destination and, uh, you know, mid range, 100 to 400, uh, you know. Uh, you can do the 70 to 200 for certain things. And of course, macro, you need macro for all the little, for all the little guys. Uh, but if you're not having fun, why are we even out there, right? You cannot create good images if you're not having fun. Uh, try different things. Try stuff out of the norm. This is multi-flash hummingbirds with a macro lens. We normally do multi-flash with a long lens. But here I said, you know what? I got enough of the long lens. This is in my backyard here in South Texas. Uh, this is a buff-bellied hummingbird. I grabbed my macro lens and I started doing multi-flash with the macro. Um, I didn't get many keepers, but I got a few and I had a blast, you know, because these guys, you know, come right up to you. They don't care. Um, uh, I talked about that roadrunner shot earlier where he was running around. This is what he was doing. He was basically catching butterflies. And we had a blast looking at, you know, seeing this guy running around and catching the butterflies. If I would have come back with no images that day, just seeing that behavior and seeing how these guys act was good enough for me. And that made it a lot of fun. Uh, if you have conditions that you just are not good for shooting certain things, try different things, right? This is at Bosque, uh, the La Pache. Um, no light that morning. I mean, no light. Completely, completely uh, cloudy. The sun, we, I don't think we saw the sun for three days that this trip that we were there. And the cranes would take off early. You know, the cranes would take off. The sun was nowhere to be seen. No light whatsoever. I put my camera at 125 of a second and I did blurs all morning long and I got some really neat stuff and I got some really different types of shots and I had a blast doing it. So target specific, again, right lens body combination, know how to work any kind of weather. And if you're not having fun, you're not gonna get the images that you want. So when you go out there next time, cover your basics, learn about exposure, you know, learn about how the, the, the photography triangle works learn how to position yourself so you can start creating images that you like, position yourself, right equipment. I can get a better background with a 600 versus I can, you know, versus a background with a one to 400. Uh, I see this in Africa a lot. I see people with the big lenses in their vehicles and they get so close to the subject that they pull a 70 to 200 or they pull a one to 400 to shoot it because their driver got them so close that now their 600 doesn't work. You don't get the backgrounds on a one to 400 that you do on the 600. So when we position ourselves for our subjects, when we're in Africa, we always look at the positioning ourselves right for the lenses that we're, you know, for the lenses that we're using. Um, and this comes again with learning, you know, everything we've talked about today. Uh, sometimes you get lucky and things align up, right? I'm not saying luck doesn't play a factor here. You know, here we're photographing, you know, uh, the white rhinos at Old Pajeta and, uh, they were, you know, we had these two grazing and all of a sudden I saw this third one come up from the side and he came right at me, right between those two and I was able to capture it. I was lucky that my car was in the right place. He was looking right at me and they all lined up perfectly. So luck does play a factor every once in a while. If you wanna follow me, the best place to follow me, if you wanna look at my work or where I'm at and the different things I'm doing, Instagram is the one I probably use the most. My Instagram no, uh, name is Hector underscore Astorga underscore photography. You can follow me on Instagram. And if you're interested in workshops, tours, ranch, or anything that I do, uh, my website is the best place to go, hectorastorga.com. Also, you can sign up for my newsletter there. My newsletter goes out once a month. And uh, information on trips, information on different articles that I write, uh, information on Sony cameras that I do um, will be all on there. So if you want to just go to my website and sign up for the newsletter, it's free. And I promise you, I won't bombard you with emails. I'll send usually one email a month, maybe two, if I have some kind of announcement. So with that, I will stop the share and I'll open it up for questions if anybody has questions. Yep. I'm gonna close the chat because now you can actually turn on your mics and ask the questions. Yeah, you, you can unmute yourself and ask a question and then mute again. Hi, I have a question on yes, sir. Uh, 
your feelings about your post-process editing. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, wildlife photographers often fall into the same category as photojournalism, where they do very little to really change the scene. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. I'm with, yes, I agree there. Uh, I, I don't, I like to do, I like to get everything in camera, mostly right. So that way I have less processing than, uh, you know, as little as processing for two reasons. I'm a big believer that getting it right in camera is the way to go. Now, nowadays, the digital darkroom, of course, is, is the computer. So yes, you need to work on highlights, shadows and stuff like that. But the closest I can get it to where I want it in camera, the least amount of time I have to spend the time in the computer. Not that I dislike the computer, but everything that I do, the one I like the least is being in front of the computer. And the other problem is that I shoot so much when I'm in tour or when I'm with clients here at the ranch, I don't have time to sit in the computer and work on images for hours because I shoot all day. The last thing I want to do is sit on the computer for four or five hours after shooting all day when I have to get up back again at five o'clock in the morning the next day. So the, 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 the shorter the processing, the better for me. So yes, I do agree with you. I change very little. I like to, I'm not a big fan of, um, of changing things or adding or cloning things. You want to do it right in camera. Now, sometimes you'll have, you know, a, a dust bunny or maybe a little branch that's out of the place. I'm okay with, you know, cloning that. Uh, but yes, you always want to uh, get it right in camera and showcase what you actually saw there in real life. There's another, there's a text question on uh, sharpening, AI sharpening. Okay. Um, again, you know, I'm not a big fan of, uh, of doing, this is what I don't like. I, and I hear this a lot. Oh, it's okay to shoot it at a high ISO because I can always run it through, through Topaz. Why are you relying on software to get a good image when you can do it right in the field? Right now, don't get me wrong. If you go out early in the morning, five o'clock in the morning in Africa, there's the sun's not up yet. And all of a sudden you have this lion taking down this giraffe. Yes, shoot it at 100,000 ISO, right? You have no light. But if you're sh shooting in good conditions and you're shooting at an astronomical high ISO because, oh, I can, ch I, can, I can fix it in post, that's not the right way to do it. Try to get it right in camera. Yes, the software is great nowadays, but nothing beats having it right in the camera. So I do use you know, uh, A sharpening or, or, or noise reduction in post but I don't rely on it for good images. You should never rely on software to get good images. Your knowledge of how to use that photography triangle that we talked about is what you should be relying to get the right ISO, to get the right you know, shutter speed that you need, depending on the circumstances that you're given. And yes, I do agree that sometimes we don't have ideal conditions, but if the conditions are not good for birds in flight that morning, I'm not gonna shoot birds in flight that morning. I'm gonna shoot more perch birds. I'll wait till I have the right conditions to shoot the birds in flight. That way my ISO stay lower and, and I don't need to sharpen as much. I don't need to do noise reduction as much. So yes, I do use it, but not as much. I use it very little actually. And I don't, I use top and I don't like to use Topaz. Topaz is a fantastic software. I'm actually one of their, you know, I'm actually, you know, associated with them. But again, it takes too long. Topaz, you know, noise reduction takes forever to work on an image, especially if it's a, you know, if it's a big image. So I don't have the time. So I, I rarely ever use it. Hector, what do you use for focusing when you're focusing? Depends on what I'm shooting. If I'm shooting uh, something that's very static, like, you know, a perch bird, I'll use uh, in my, you know, the focus mode. It's called uh, expandable tracking spot, which is not a single spot, but a little bit bigger. If I'm shooting birds, you know, uh, big birds in flight, like eagles, cranes, uh, hawks, stuff like that, I'll go to more of a zone type, you know, uh, focus, uh, focal mode. Mm -hmm. um, I do use tracking for pretty much everything. Um, eye detection focusing. I hear people say, oh, this is the greatest thing ever. Yeah, it's good, but it's not perfect. So sometimes I'll turn it off. Sometimes I'll have it on. And again, it all depends on the situation and it all depends what I'm targeting. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I do use different focusing modes from single point to expandable point to zone point. The only one I can say I never use is wide. I don't like to use wide because the camera starts act, picking stuff that you don't want to pick. Um, so from zone all the way to single point. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, 68 people out there. We must have questions. <laughs> <laughs> We're overwhelmed by the gorgeous photography and this was an excellent presentation thank you appreciate that that was Glad great, great. Uh, so, just so Hector, what is your favorite animal to uh, to photograph 
Oh, that's a tough question. I love them all. <laughs> but if I had to pick one, it would, it would be, if I had to pick one, and again, I love everything that I photograph, every, every place I go to photograph, every place I take clients to photograph, I love them all. But if I had to pick one, it would probably be the mountain gorillas. The what? The mountain gorillas in Uganda. Oh. And I thought he was going to say cheetah. <laughs> now, cheetah is my favorite cat. <laughs> <laughs> yes I, and i love all cats i love photographing cats but if, I, I really really like cheetahs it's it's so different than all the other ones most cats are ambushers right cheetah it relies on speed to hunt and they're built so differently than all the other ones and that's why i like them how unique they are honey i was anticipating cheetahs as well <laughs> no cheetahs to mention there's only about there's only about 6500 cheetahs left in the world so they're hard yes. to find Less and a lot less, you know, and a lot less uh, mountain gorillas as well, unfortunately. But they're making a comeback, you know. Uh, they're starting numbers are starting to climb in the last ten years because of the conservation efforts and because it's become popular to go see them. So now, unfortunately, this is kind of like, um, you know, some people don't like it, but I'm okay with it. There's some money value to them, so now they're making sure they're protected because um, they're making money off of them, and that's how kind of conservation works nowadays. Mm -hmm. Hey, Hector, I really appreciated your, your comments about muscle memory and practice, practice, practice. Yes, sir. I, I, I shoot a lot of sports related stuff, rodeo, mm -hmm. soccer, that sort of thing. Yes. And it's constantly moving the zoom Correct. lens and, and working out that part of it anyway. Correct. Yeah. Wildlife photographers and sport photographers, we don't get a second chance sometimes. If, if you don't if you don't dial in those settings just right, it's you know, it happens, it's over and that's it. You don't get a second chance. So, yes. Sports, photo sports photography is just as hard as wildlife photography. So, because again, our subjects don't do what we want them to do. <laughs> Hector, how, how early do the painted bunnings come to the ranch that you work at? Uh, Mid-April. Mid-April is when they usually start arriving, but the, by the end of April, they're here. And they okay. stay uh, um, uh, May, June, July, and then by mid-August is when they start to leave. All right, thanks. But you need to tell him how hot it is in July and August. <laughs> July and August. Uh, July is going to be about a 105, 110. August about 113 with about 80% humidity. So, yeah, it's not fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, y'all, most of you are from Texas. You all know that. <laughs> okay, question on the, on the chat. What kind of settings techniques do you use to keep a nice, sharp, or a fast-moving animal like a wolf? Again, you know, it's a... It's, uh, Depending on the subject, it depends on the focal mode that I'll be using. Uh, I do use eye detection on the camera, I, although it's not perfect. It's much better than what it used to be. And uh, if it's a subject that's moving fast, I, you know, again, tracking is all, I always, my focus modes are always in tracking in, with, in Sony. I'm not sure what the other camera companies name it. But, it. but that means is that once I acquire focus, that focus goes with the subject as long as I don't release my 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 back button focus right so that's how I track uh, my, my subject as it's moving now which uh, which mode it all depends on the subject if it's a small subject I'll tend to use a smaller point if it's a bigger subject I'll start with with uh, with a wider zone and then again once the focusing is acquired it'll it'll and, and the eye detection is on it'll go to the eye uh, but then again, just remember, eye detection is is good, but it's not perfect. I've missed shots because of eye detection. All of a sudden, you you have the focus on the eye, the the subject moves a little bit, and it goes right to its foot, or it goes right to the wing, or it goes right to its butt. So, you, know, you never know. And and you have a perfectly sharp leg, but the head is not sharp because the eye detection thought that was an eye. So again, you know, pick your poison. Sometimes I'll turn the eye detection off if I see that the, for example, quail. Quail is a perfect example. Bob White. They have so many scales and so many little round patterns on their chest that the eye detection goes crazy. It doesn't know which one's the eye and which one's the scale. So it'll start jumping all over the place. So when I'm photographing quail, I turn it off and I put the focus point on the head myself. What is the best way to find whooping cranes right now? Uh, whooping cranes are in Aransas National Refuge. They start arriving in November and they'll be there till probably mid next month, mid March is when they go back. And the best way to photograph them is by boat. You go, you hire a boat captain to take you out there. That way you can get close to them. At the Aransas National Refuge in Rockport, Texas. Mm -hmm. Do you use back button focus? I use back button focus for everything. So yes, I use it for flying birds. 
Hey, Hector, what do you use for white balance? Do you do automatic white balance? Um, no, I, I tend to shoot, of course, I shoot raw, so you can change it after the fact, yeah. but I tend, I tend to shoot sunny uh, really? more. Yeah. Uh, now, sometimes if you shoot sunny, you'll start blowing the red channel. So that's when, if I see that my red channel is blowing on my histograms, I'll go to auto because auto white balance is a little bit colder than sunny. Now, if you're still blowing the red channel in auto white balance, then I'll go to Kelvin and I'll set it to about 4,200 Kelvin on the white balance to not blow the red channel. And remember, even though it looks funky being that cold, you can change it in post, uh, you know, as long as you're shooting raw because you don't want to burn, you know, you don't want to burn the channels. You don't want to burn your red channel or your blue channel. Yeah, okay, thanks. Okay. Any other questions? Bonnie, did you want to say a few last words? Well, I just wanted to make sure I was doing the same thing, kind of looking down in the chat. But yes, uh, thank you very much, Hector. Um, My pleasure. And I hope that everybody look, goes and looks at his site. Uh, those who have traveled with him, and there are several of you on here, we all agree, go with Hector. He'll put you in the right place at the right time. Thank uh, you. Also, the ranch is a great place to visit. Just don't go with us because we always take rain to the ranch. <laughs> and, and also I'm, I'm going to remind everybody I've recorded the meeting and I'll put this meeting up and send out a link to everybody yeah Hector I have one last question yes ma'am uh do you always if you go to Africa do you have to have a 600 millimeter is that a I, I love my no you don't you don't have to uh you can you know a 400 will do uh mm -hmm. me personally I love my 600 and my 400 so those are the two lenses that I use and I'll take like a 100 to 400 as well for the more environmental type, you know, type shots. Uh, yeah. But no, you don't need to go with a 600. A 400 will do. Uh, yeah. Also, the, the big telezooms work really well. Like, you know, like the Sigmas 50 to 500, uh, you know, all those, that market of lenses work really well because they're very versatile. And you can get a little bit of everything with those lenses as well. Uh, and what about traveling with the restrictions on, on carry on luggage and stuff? I take it you don't. You don't check those lenses you carry. No, no, I do not. I have a, I have my system down to a science because I travel so much. Uh, my carry-on is my Pelican Air, where my big lens goes. And then my backpack, my 400 and my other stuff goes in my backpack. Uh -huh. uh, if you go to my website and you go to the newsletters, all the past newsletters are there. And I believe it's June or July of 22. And you can see the dates and everything there. I think it's either June or July of uh, 2022. Uh, on one of the newsletters, I have a, I have an article on how to travel as a wildlife photographer and what I do and how I carry my stuff, what I look for in terms of what kind of planes I look for, how I book my flights, what equipment I use in terms of camera bags, uh, everything, everything's on there. So it's a good article to go look for, and it'll give you a full understanding on how I travel with all my gear. And that was June, 2022? June or July of 2022. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Oh, and or, I'm oh, sorry, 21, 21, 21. Yeah. And I may be catching you off guard here, Hector, but you probably have a general idea. Uh, just so you know, he's packed this several times. Like, how many days did you travel last year, Hector? Wow. Um, Maybe I should ask, how many days were you home? That's easier. <laughs> I was home last year, I would say the whole year, 30 days. Yeah. Wow. Oh. Well, last year was unique because what happened to me last year was that trips from 2020 and 2021 that didn't go due to the pandemic um, went last year. A lot of my clients did not want to cancel. They just said, no, when it opens, we'll go. And my problem was since my trips sell out so, so far ahead, by the time that a trip canceled in 21, the 22 trips were full. So I had to add more trips to be able to accommodate everybody. So I ended up doing 26 photo tours last year. Uh, and believe me, that's not part of my, my, my business plan. I do not want to do 26 photo tours in a year. Uh, but luckily, after January 1st, I'm back to normal. I'm back to my regular schedule. Uh, but yeah, last year was crazy because of everything we had to make up due to the pandemic. I had trouble with these little hopper planes. You hardly have room for your purse. Yes. You know, uh, one of the things, if you read the, my article, one of the things that I talk about is when you're booking your flights, I'm always looking at the equipment that's flying. When I'm talking about equipment, I'm talking the type of plane. Uh, I will do a six hour layover versus a two hour layover if I'm in a bigger plane. So when I'm booking my flights, I'm always looking at that. Embraer 145, avoid like the plague. Canada, regional jet. 
avoid yeah. like the plague. <laughs> it's not that they want to take your stuff away. They have to because the plane has no overhead. So you have no choice. They're going to take your stuff away. So if I'm, if I'm booking my flights and I see that my, you know, one, one of my, my segments is in an Embraer 145, now nope, I'll do a longer layover to get on a bigger plane. Uh, mm-hmm. or I'll, do, I'll change the route to get on a bigger plane. Because again, we, you know, as, as you'll know, we cannot check our stuff in. Um, so always look at the equipment that they're flying. I fly, um, I fly United everywhere, not because I'm in love with United, they're okay, but I have status with them. I'm 1K with them, I fly so much. So I'm always boarding first, I'm always getting upgraded. I don't have to worry about overhead because I'm the first one on the plane. And that's why I keep flying with them because I have that status that I don't, I, and, and again, when you're 1K with them, I can literally have a piano on my back and walk in that plane. <laughs> They don't bother you. So again, all that's in the article, by the way. If you read that article, it talks about all that and how, what I look for when I fly, why I fly the way I fly. Because again, it's, it's actually a science to fly with all this gear. Because as you all know, yeah. we cannot check it in. So Hector, Hector, one tip uh, for my trip to, to Zambia this, uh, this summer. We've got, yes, I've got 10 photographers going. And it was actually cheaper uh, to rent, well, to charter um, a Cessna caravan that fits 14 people. Yes. So for the for the hopping between camps, we mm-hmm. don't have to worry too much about our weight of gear and stuff. Yeah, so that just we, makes things a lot that much easier. Yeah, we do something very similar in Kenya because the way we the way I have set up the logistics when we do in Kenya because we do the same. We fly the same. We fly the same planes, and uh, I have it set up that when we fly, we only fly with our camera gear. All of our regular luggage goes by land and it catches up to us that night. So that mm-hmm. way we don't have to be worrying about the 35, you know, 35 uh, uh, pound limit, uh, th- a 30 kilo limit and all that kind of stuff. So yes, it's, it's best to charter and, or, or plan it or do the logistics that you only fly with camera gear. Everything else follows by land and it'll eventually catch up to you later that day. Yeah. Who needs clean clothes? You're with, you're, right. you're with like-minded people. I give up. I give away my clothes if I can have my cameras with me. <laughs> I don't care if it shows up later that day. But again, you know, it's all about planning it and, and having the correct logistics and and seeing, you know, and seeing, uh, you know, how to get there without having to check your gear and, and how to get there properly. Right. Hmm. And yeah. Connie, Connie was with me in Africa last last year. So she knows <laughs> when we fly, we only fly with our bare essentials and then we get our clothing that, you know, later that night. Yeah. And I did. And Dave and I both have 400. So. You know, we were fine. Now people like Melinda who were on there, she had her 600, I think. And but again, we're only flying with a camera gear, so we don't have to worry about the, the weight of our, of our clothes. So yeah, it works out real well. Mm. Uh, George Spann, great job. Just curious, who was your mentor for wildlife photography? Uh, a lot of people, George. Um, the way I shoot is little bits and pieces I've learned from friends and other photographers along my journey. Uh, you know, uh, I have friends that I like the way, you know, uh, I like the way Larry does this. So I picked that up. I like the way Alan does this. I picked it up. I like the way this photographer does this and I picked it up. So uh, I really don't have one mentor. I can say that along my journey, I've met a ton of great, great photographers that I've picked up different things from them. And that's what I always tell my clients too, is, you know, I'm going to teach you how I do it. It doesn't mean that the way I do it is the only way. In photography, there's multiple ways to do it. Uh, People ask me all the time, should I shoot manual? Should I shoot aperture? Should I shoot shutter priority? I don't care how you shoot as long as your final result is there. If your final result is there and it's good, I don't care how you got there as long as you're getting there, right? Uh, I'm going to teach you how I do it. You can take that knowledge and incorporate it into your into your workflow and the way you shoot, but it doesn't have to mean that the, the way I do it is the only way. So the way I shoot is little bits and pieces that I learned along the way from some very good photographers. And I'll be honest with you, sometimes I learn stuff from my clients too, because they'll come up with, oh, I do this one. And I was like, wait a minute, that, that's, that works. So again, um, we're always learning. You know, I learn as much from my clients as my clients learn from me. And I'm a big believer in the, the, the recent tours and workshops and things work so well is because of the sharing of ideas between everybody, you know? We all learn not only from the instructor, but from the other participants. And we, and, uh, you know, we see the way people do different things and we can incorporate that into, into our own workflow or into the own way we shoot things or the way we process or, you know, in any process of this whole, you know, of, of the photography, you know, process from shooting in the field to actual processing. So I really don't have one mentor, but I do, I have picked up a lot of stuff from photographers that I truly, truly respect and I've worked with before and I've met throughout my journey. 
Hector, do you have goals for the future for your photography? You you've been doing it for so long. Um, yes. I plan to do this for another 10 years. Uh, to guide trips and and do workshops. Mm -hmm. I'm 52 years old. I'm going to do this for another 10 years and that's it. I'm done. And I don't, not, I'm not done with photography. I'm done with clients. I'm going to keep traveling for me. <laughs> uh, but yes, I do have goals. I, I always, um, you know, when I photograph, I'm, like I said earlier, I'm very target oriented. So I like to target a lot of what I'm doing. And, and an idea pops into my mind of something I want to shoot. And I will work towards that goal, you know. Um, so yes, I'm always looking for new things to shoot, or I'm always looking for other, you know, other images to create. Uh, I'm a big believer that good compositions, one of the main, you know, one of the main ingredients for a good composition is showing your audience something that they have never seen. I don't care if it's a common subject, but you're shooting a common subject in a totally different way or a totally different perspective that they've never seen makes for good compositions. So that's kind of what I target now when I go out for my own personal photography. Uh, you know, always changing things, showing, showcasing sub common, even if it's a common subject, just showcasing it a different way. Uh, something that, you know, is not, normally done because again i believe that catches your audience it tells a story better makes uh you know uh, makes a better image and again gives you a challenge to keep this interesting you know this started as a hobby for me uh it became my job and if it if it, if it was just my job i think i would get bored i still have to challenge myself i still have to you know put goals towards what i want to create in order to keep this interesting now don't get me wrong i love doing this i'm very blessed that i can do this for a living because i love people i love sharing i love traveling with people I, I'm, I'm 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 a big people person um so this is great for me and i'm very blessed that i can do this but yes i do challenge myself to do different things in my own work to keep it interesting and to keep me going mm -hmm. yeah i think we all need goals yes of course okay. are we uh, are we through with the questions Kathy? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Are there any other questions, Chuck, or chat? I don't, I don't see anything coming up here. Okay. Well, Hector, I am just really, really amazed. And I'm going to check out your website. I know Connie has praised you many times. And so I was looking forward to this presentation to see exactly why she was so enthused with you now i know <laughs> <laughs> well thank you and again thank you for having me it's always it's always a pleasure to share with 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 different groups throughout the country especially people from texas you know fellow texans mm -hmm. uh, thank you for inviting me and it's it's i've had a ton oh, no. of fun for you guys well, really thank, appreciate it. thank you for for coming to us and showing us and sharing your your talents and your um beautiful photography and and just everything that you do so Thank you. This, this has been a very awesome presentation. Glad you enjoyed it. Oh, very much so. So anyway, but thank you. <laughs>